Everybody, we are back. It is Tape to Live's favorite podcast, favorite channel, favorite everything. We are back. You guys already know what to do. Hit the subscribe button. Subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. Hit the like button if you like it. Hit the dislike button if you don't like it. Leave a comment if you like it. Leave a comment if you don't like it. Also, follow us on Twitter at the Mark John NFL for me, at mholder95 for Matt. And of course, pandasubs.com, TDL. Use that discount code for 35% off all your protein, all your uh, workout stuff there. Go ahead and get it at pandasubs.com. All right. So this week, you got the New York Giants. So, uh, you, of course, I, I brought my old friend from uh, Inside the Pylon uh, at Nick Filato and then uh, at Dan Sh- is Sh- Schneier. How, Nobody how knows how to pronounce it. You actually got it right almost on the first time. Oh, Schneier. Yeah. Like Schneier. Schneider, okay. All right. Been, been mistaken for a lot of people in my life. The first was Dan Schneider, the old. <laughs> Redskins owner, but he, uh, thank God that he's no longer the owner because I hate it every time that happened. And yeah. then there's also some freaking weirdo on Nickelodeon who like ran the Nickelodeon shows when we were kids, who's like a foot guy, fetish guy, all sorts of bad things going on with that guy. And people DM me all the time, like, what are you going to do? Here's a picture of my foot. Like, it's like all sorts of crazy crap going on there. So, Marcus, I got a name. <laughs> all right, man. Great, great introduction there. That's awesome. Awesome introduction. All right. So, and, uh, uh, go ahead, introduce you guys' podcast. You know, talk about uh, a little bit, a little bit about yourselves. Uh, like I said, I, Nick, I know you from uh, Inside the Pylon, working with you over there. Uh, go ahead, talk about you guys' selves a little bit. Yeah, we host the Big Blue Banter podcast. We go over the X's and O's, dive really deep into the film analysis, as well as everything that has to do with the New York Football Giants. Got to say, very disappointing season. I'm Nick Filato. You can find me at Nick Filato. He is Dan Schneier NFL. That is S C H N E I E R. N F L and uh yeah and I'm also uh, over there I'm fellow SB Nation person I work for uh, Big Blue View as well the Giants page over there yeah First so I wanted to get into go you oh go ahead Marcus no 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 go ahead, go ahead. you're good I to, before we do anything I wanted to get into what in the hell is going on with the Raiders this week so we start off with me getting an alert right before I'm going to bed that night oh I was going God. to bed early for me which is you know 1 a.m on the East Coast mm. time that the Raiders fired everybody and even cooler for at least my angle, Marcus, this is one I want to get into first is uh-huh. a few minutes later from Schefter, we get an alert. Antonio Pierce, a Giants legend, one of my favorite players of all time, one of the most underrated players in the franchise's history, one of the most cerebral players to ever play the position, one of the best leaders to ever step foot in that locker room, is now going to lead the Raiders. And we see some videos today. Devontae Adams, who was angry on the sideline last game, throwing his helmet, now smiling in the locker room, playing basketball. Any thoughts early on Pearson? I kind of want to know how he rose so far up the ranks from like linebackers coach to somebody who can take over as an interim right away. Yeah, you know, especially with Antonio Pierce, I think what Pierce is going to bring is leadership, man. You could already tell. I didn't know he was a Raiders fan, which is a very interesting dynamic with Raiders fans itself. Mm -hmm. Raiders have this most loyal type of thing where they're like this, you know, if you're not a Raiders media guy, if you're not a Raiders fan as a media guy, we don't like you, those type of things. So I think him being a Raiders fan and being the Raiders coach coming from Compton, California, I think that's going to make a big deal, especially with Raider fans, especially if they start pulling out some wins here. Uh, you know, you can see the locker room today is hilarious. All, all what was happening around there, the locker room just looked totally different, right? I mean, it's, they're playing basketball. They're doing all these different types of things that they're, they're uh, you know, <laughs> they're wrestling the offensive linemen. It was such an interesting dynamic because Josh McDaniels was just a uh, terrible leader. I mean, <laughs> he, he, even even like with uh, Hunter Renfro, what he said, they were walking on eggshells today. I mean, for Hunter yeah, Renfro to come yeah. out and say that today. That's the Joe Judge impact. Same thing yeah. with Joe Judge. They were walking on eggshells the whole time. Can't coach like that. Yeah, they're, they're not Bill Belichick. Um, yeah. you know, there's this book. Uh, it's called uh, Better to Be Feared about the Patriots. And there's this uh, chapter in it called I'm Not Bill. And I think that – and it basically talks about how all the Patriots guys fail – because they try to be Bill Belichick and Josh McTain was trying it again. Like, I don't understand why it didn't work the first time. Why do you think you could do it twice? And, you know, you have these guys, I mean, we all ignored that report last year from the, um, from that, uh, the, 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 the surveyed all the players and tried to figure out what was happening. And, you know, they came in like last and player treatment and they said they did work too many hours. Mm-hmm. So people ignored that. But we all see that came and bite, bit them in the ass a little bit. And you see what's happening. They're three and five. I mean, you know how they're three and five. I have no idea, <laughs> uh, to be honest. They're, they've been awful on offense all year, and that's what he's supposed to do. But, you know, I, hopefully I don't see Dagger as much as I've been seeing it. So I'm happy about that. <laughs> 
Dude, I texted you maybe about three weeks ago, and I was like, Josh McDaniels has to be the most off-putting head football coach in NFL history. Just the most dislikable person out there on the sidelines. So this is not a surprise whatsoever. And then watching Monday Night Football, man, I just I was like, man, I think this guy's gonna get fired. We're on the we're in Pacific time zone. I got to alert at ten o'clock at night. I'm like, oh shit. He's gone. I'm like, wow, and we have to play him this week. It's yep. going to be something if Antonio Pierce pulls this off and defeats his old team, and it would be right up the alley of the 2023 New York Giants because everything has gone wrong for the Giants this season. Yeah, I mean, looking at your guys' this season, I mean, there's high expectations for you guys. I mean, yep. for Raiders fans, we kind of we all felt like maybe we seven and ten, right? Yeah. Seven to ten would be a good season. You guys have playoff aspirations, so let's talk about your guys'. Uh, you know, the, the defense seems to be coming ar- around a little bit, but you know, offensively, it's been a really big disappointment, especially with Daniel Jones. Talk about Daniel Jones a little bit. His season, he's coming back this week. You know, you know, uh, his backup is probably only going to be Tommy DeVito. So uh, talk about Daniel Jones a little bit. Yeah, there was a ton of expectations on Daniel Jones. The Giants were put into a position where it was, you're going to let this guy walk or you're going to pay him. And the market for quarterbacks is very expensive. So we all know he earned this $40 million a year contract coming off his best season, first year with Brian Dable, now a year removed from the offense ran by Jason Garrett. And the thought process was he's going to take another incremental step in his career. Mm. That didn't happen, but also go back to the first drive of week one. Star left tackle Andrew Thomas ends up hurting his hamstring on that drive. And everything has just been downhill since that moment. And I think his internal clock just was exhausted. And he couldn't (laughs) feel the pocket whatsoever. He was back there getting pressured, getting hit. There were times where protection actually held up and he would still bail the pocket. So that was just an issue. And I think he also was dealing with this neck ailment or whatever the hell it was probably before he took a step away from the starting lineup. And that's something that he's been dealing with in his career, dating back to 2021 season. Last year, he had surgery before the season and uh, showed up at training camp with a scar. Everybody was talking about it. Didn't seem to be an issue. But it's been a, um, a it just had an entire failure organizationally on the offensive side of the football. I, I never believed, and I think I could speak for Dan here, Daniel Jones isn't uh, – uh, he's not an elite player, right? That's not who he is. You can win with a player like Daniel Jones, but he's not the – kind of player who's going to put the team on his back he's not the kind of player who's going to challenge the field side outside the numbers from the far hash that's not necessarily who Daniel Jones is and when you watch the offense you can see that the offense is somewhat limited it doesn't do all of those things so you need the bootlegs and you need his legs and you need all of that to work for Daniel Jones to be a successful quarterback in this season yeah. without Andrew Thomas and with the protection issues none of that has worked and it's all just been a, a a failure and it's not necessarily his fault but it's just the reality of the 2023 Giants Okay. Yeah. yeah. Go, ahead, go, ahead. go ahead. No, go ahead, Marcus. No, I was going uh, to ask how Saquon Barkley ties into that because I know Barkley, you know, he's got injured too, right? And, you know, that kind of hurt the offense as well. So how, how does he kind of tie into all of that? Because the offensive line goes down because he was actually, even with Daniel Jones, you know, the factor was Barkley. That's why he had the, the holdout, all those things. How, what's my worth? You paid Daniel Jones. Right. What is he looking like this season? And, and you know, the, how has the offensive line affected him? Yeah, the Barkley factor is certainly an interesting one. You know, cases have been made that the Giants offense with Barkley and without Barkley is very different in the sense of how defenses can play the Giants and how defenses decide to play the Giants. But I think, Marcus, you are someone who watches the film a lot, and you know this, and Nick and I know this very well. A case can be made that a running back can make some kind of impact on how defense plays you, but the real impact comes from the quarterback. Will the quarterback challenge the field side? Will the quarterback throw into tight windows? Will the quarterback their whole shots that's what th- dictates where how the defense plays you schematically so unfortunately for me it's hard for me to put so much of that factor look it's easier life is easier with saquon barkley right you can get under center you can run play action you can run design drops that i'm excited to see daniel jones run some of what we saw against arizona people remember that arizona game his best of the season daniel jones well it wasn't just him operating no huddle tempo at a shotgun it was him taking his shots from under center where he can fake the handoff get into that deep drop and rip the football. And that's because Saquon Barkley was on the field. So there is a factor to it. 
But ultimately for me, Marcus, it comes down to what really Nick said. And, you know, I tweeted about this right after the Eagles game in January. I said, everyone's so focused on the Giants' schedule getting a lot harder next year and regression coming because of that. I said, that's not my concern. My concern is, will defenses have so much film, what the Giants did schematically, and will they be able to adjust to it? And will the Giants have any counterpunch? And that counterpunch always had to come from Daniel Jones because the other part of it was, the reason it was even there in the first place was because of Brian Dable and Mike Kafka. They're the reason why last year happened. They designed an offense out of no nowhere and made Daniel Jones passable and workable and to a large extent effective. He was like top 10 in EPA last year. Daniel Jones. Now a lot of that is heavily weighted towards his scrambles that bring mm-hmm. brought up his EPA. They were still dead last in explosive pass plays, yeah. but he created an offense that worked, but now defenses that film on it. Like Nick said, they adjusted to not only the boot action, but they adjusted to a lot of the passing concepts, the quick game. It was still a lot of slants, flat curl flats, quick game. Now they're driving on that. Now they're sitting mm-hmm. on that. Now they're playing trap coverages, which they did last year but they're doing even more. They're leaving the field. So really when it comes down to it, Marcus, is this. Daniel Jones, we're at an interesting point with him after these injuries and after this missed time and after the regression of the offense. He's actually entering an interesting stage right here because he has to win football games. And why is that, Marcus? If he doesn't win football games down the stretch run, the Giants are going to have a top five pick. If they have a top five pick, that's when things get to really interesting because no matter what, I think they're adding a quarterback this draft. They were looking at Hendon Hooker last draft. He They didn't ultimately go with Hendon Hooker. They had a lot of players they liked. They had a center they really liked, they had a receiver they really liked. But they were looking at quarterbacks in that draft. And if they don't go first round, they're going second or third round, I think, no matter what, given Taylor's expiring contract and given the state of Daniel Jones right now. So this is a big – this is what's really interesting about this game coming up right now against the Raiders and then moving forward. This is almost like Daniel Jones has to prove himself all over again, even though he has next year guaranteed with money. The year after that isn't, and so we'll see what happens. And I would say it's even beyond that just a little bit, Marcus, because last year – they relied so much on efficiency and we know efficiency doesn't always carry over year after year. So even if Daniel Jones gets back to playing efficient football for me to be sold at all on Daniel Jones, I need to see him create explosive plays because Dan touched on this. Yeah. The giants were dead last. They, they made the playoffs. They won a playoff game. They were dead last in explosive plays last year. Think about all of the shitty. I don't know if I can curse here, but all of, the, <laughs> all of the shitty offenses last season the jets the steelers the rams all these offenses. the giants had less explosive plays on offense than all of them and when there's no efficiency when you're not efficient with the football then the offense can't run at all that's not necessarily the offense that i want to run and i don't think that's the right. quarterback that brian dable wants personally you nailed it yeah and I one mean, more thing on that when right. you see i'm just gonna add one more thing to this Marcus, and i'll be done with this but it's such a good point by nick no longer willing to make that excuse either. I'm with Nick. I'm no longer willing to make excuses. Of, eh, let's just see what happens. Oh, maybe it'll get better. No, 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 no. When Tyrod Taylor played, he had 87 pass attempts going into his game against the Jets, and he had more explosive plays than Daniel Jones, or two less explosive plays than Daniel Jones had all season in like four or five times the attempts. Or no, mm. dating back to the start of 2022. I don't have the wow. stat right in front of me, but it's like egregious numbers. And so Tyrod Taylor was able to do it in a limited sample size enough daniel jones has to do it there's no more they don't have this they don't have that they don't have that he has to start stretching these defenses and challenging all areas of the field efficiency is no longer good enough for any kind of long-term feeling amongst nick and i and and hopefully for the rest of giants fans and i know you have a similar feeling because you have a quarterback in jimmy garoppolo who also doesn't challenge all areas of the field (laughs) see see see, now i gotta ask a follow-up question because you know i'm I'm, i like quarterbacks so you're talking about daniel jones not throwing downfield because as a rookie, didn't he throw downfield as that's a rookie? The, that's there the problem because that's what goes. This debate is made among Giants fans all the time. Did <laughs> okay, Joe Judge and Jason Garrett ruin him from a mindset standpoint, from a processing standpoint? It's certainly possible. He did throw downfield a little more, but just to give you a little more uh, insight into that, Marcus, it was a system that used a ton of half field, high low reads, just very simple stuff. And he did a really good job of reading high to low. And he did used to read high to low. It doesn't feel like he reads high to low anymore. It feels like he just reads low to low these days. But he did used to read high to low. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I'll say this, too, to, to, to really build upon that. He only averaged 6.6 yards per attempt right. in 2019. We act yeah. as if he averaged, like, 8 right. yards per attempt. It, it still yeah. was pretty modest. Yeah, Modest, yeah. 6.6 is even bad from by most standards, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I, I just felt like, as a rookie, I, he just – Stop. Do the ball down feel a little bit more. I don't know. Uh, so that is interesting because, you know, Jason Garrett, <laughs> I always laugh when I because I, I watch every quarterback of the summer, and I swear he started every game with sticks or like what they call spacing. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, our listeners are going to love that. Yeah, love that. <laughs> I swear to God he did. Like It was like first game, first play, first pass. It was the same. I was like, wow. Okay. He's, he's like, it's so ingrained in his head. He just wants to run sticks. Like he just can't get away from it. 
Okay. All right. All right. Yeah, Let's talk wild. about your new quarterback, though, Aiden okay. O'Connell, because I'm really intrigued by him. Nick and I actually watched a decent amount of his tape because we fell in love with the receiver, uh, Charlie Jones, who's actually on the Bengals now yeah. out of Purdue. And because we wanted to watch a lot of Charlie Jones, we wanted to, we ended up watching a lot of Aiden O'Connell. And we got to say this. We were we, we talked about it right after watching Jones. We're like, eh, Aiden O'Connell's kind of good. Like his tape is kind of better than a lot of these quarterbacks we watch on tape at the collegiate level coming into that draft class, at least. So what are your thoughts on Aiden O'Connell as he goes into, I believe this is his second start. Um, this Sunday. So what I like about Aiden O'Connell is that he had a terrible first half against Chargers. Like he was awful. And even on film, like there's, he was holding the ball too long on some of those sacks a couple of times uh, that caused the fumbles. He had a read there and he's like, kind of was basically unsure of himself and they went down 24 to seven and he was just like, fuck it. I'm just going to start chucking it downfield and making plays. And, and they started coming back. And he started anticipating, and he kind of just let loose. And I, I kind of felt like, I don't know, if De when Devontae got hurt that game, he came back and made it, maybe said something to him and gave him some confidence. But he just – they went down 24-7, and it was like, I may, I may never start again. So I might as well just start throwing the ball downfield and playing with some toughness. And I think that grit and him almost making that comeback – because I still think that those plays and plays you threw, threw interceptions on were on McDaniels because McDaniels ran the same damn play on the same – in the same spot on the previous drive, and then he throws an interception the next time they run it. So that's a little bit on McDaniels a little bit to me. And I, I feel like he just has a good I feel for that offense as a young player. Um, and, you know, your Devontae Adams rave about him today. I, you know, that was kind of big. He raved about him after the game. Because I'm telling you, like, most a lot of rookie quarterbacks would have crumbled after that performance he had, man, in the first half. And he just came out firing. And that really showed me a lot of respect for with anything that – with anything that happens after that because he becomes that type of tough quarterback, that gritty guy that's not going to worry about making mistakes. And I really like that about him. And he's really accurate. I think he's accurate overall. He could throw out some of the numbers, which I haven't seen all year. It's been terrible with Jimmy Garoppolo. He cannot throw out the size of the numbers. And teams just started playing dig routes. So uh, they, they're going to have to mix it up a little bit with that. But he can throw outside the numbers. And that's how they came back as the Chargers because the Chargers were playing on the dig routes. And Aiden O'Connell started throwing outside the numbers and he started coming back. I mean, usually Brian Hoyer couldn't do it. The Bears just ate him up. Jimmy Garoppolo can't do that right now. And Garoppolo's been taking terrible. And this offense is just too much for him. It's too much for his brain. He can't move. It's not Shanahan just pointing. He actually has to play quarterback. <laughs> and and Josh McDaniels' problem, he thought every quarterback is Tom Brady. So he gives him the, the kind of the reign to do everything. And Derek Carr's problem, too. Derek Carr's not Tom Brady, so it's not going to look very good. And that was kind of the problem with McDaniels. So hopefully – Bo Hargree, who I don't know much about. He's only from Adam Gase, and he's under McDaniels. I don't know much about him. Hopefully they can make the offense easier for him. Maybe they listen to Scott Turner a little bit. Mm. So uh, I'm interested in seeing how O'Connell looks this week. What's Scott Turner's role there? Because he's quite familiar with the New York Giants. I don't know. To be honest, man, I, I, he's, uh, they don't run any of uh, North Turner or any right. Eric Correale or anything like that. So I don't know why he's there. He's supposed to be the passing game coordinator. Mm. He's supposed to Weird. be. <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> but I thought they're going to run some more West Coast stuff this year. I thought we we're going to see more choice routes, uh, moving right. Adams around, kind of use Adams like Terry McLaurin a little bit and move him around like he did in Washington. But I didn't see anything from Scott Turner this year at all. So maybe he gets more to the forefront because he didn't get fired. He's still there. He's still the passing game coordinator from everything I know. So he might have more input in the passing game. And I think he'll be a whole lot better for Aiden O'Connell because Aiden O'Connell has a great short passing game. His, his release is excellent. He anticipates with short passing. He's really good there. And you can get a lot out of him, a lot of those slants, like running the, the Hasi juke that they like to run. We didn't see any of that with him the first time they ran, they ran the, uh, you know, ran the offense. And I think you could move Adams around a little bit more too. And maybe they get more creative with Adams and they try to turn, McDaniels try to turn Adams into Randy Moss which it, he got 1,500 yards out of it. But, I mean, it, it didn't work overall, like you see this year, right? You don't, If you don't have a guy that's going to go down field. So, uh, yeah, I think they're going to mix it up a little bit different, hopefully, and not do this kind of same bland passing game that Josh McDaniels was doing. You brought up Hasi Juke, and I think that's a, an interesting concept because I look at Hunter Renfro, and he just seems like a guy who's just cast to the side. Imagining him running that middle-of-the-field route where he's just juking somebody out of their shoes, it'd probably be Cordell Flott, who was our second-year cornerback out of LSU. The Giants, Joe Shane, spent a third-round pick on, who's really coming along right now. Yeah. He's had, I would say, two or three games that are really strong, and Giant fans are really starting to galvanize around Cordell Flott. But do you think Hunter Renfro's 
role will actually grow and he'll become used and utilized in this offense because this dude was a pro bowler not that long ago. He's still relatively young, and it seems like Josh McDaniels just uh, cast this dude to the side. That's an outsider's perspective. You can tell me if I'm wrong, though. Oh, yeah, he cast him to the side big time. The thing they try to do with him, and one of the reasons why he hasn't been as effective is they changed his routes. So, you know, Gruden really let him loose in 2021, and, he, you know, he started just working people, doing a lot of rocker steps. He has an awesome oh, yeah. rocker step. He gives the rocky to sleep and then have you go on the other way and uh they kind of neutered him in my opinion uh he became really stiff he's, he's not really a guy who's gonna just beat you naturally on a route he's got to do some more wiggles he's got he's got to mix it up a little bit and that's what gruden allowed him to do you saw some of those routes let's you know do, do like three man three-way routes where you do three different moves and then come back inside and him and Derek Carr would work on that after practice but I mcdaniels mean, came in he's like you're not running routes like that so it came to get a little bit harder for him to win inside it. And he was getting locked up by some, you know, normal slot, slot cornerbacks like Bryce Callahan and guys like that. They were locking him up and he couldn't really get any movement or win anymore. And so it kind of, that's why he stopped, stopped playing because he wasn't winning. But the reason why he wasn't winning is because they neutered his routes. So I think we're going to see him be more free now. And, you know, those type of inside routes like Ha C Juke that they really run. I thought that he was going to eat on those two. I, that was kind of my idea. But if you're changing his routes, um, it changes everything. Because one thing I noticed, I mean, I went to training camp uh, last year, and they, they, like, had slot receivers, like, run their own practice, basically. So I don't know what he thinks of slot receivers or what they're supposed to be, but they didn't, like, have – they weren't with the wide receiver group. It was the weirdest thing. I've never – I've been to a lot of practices. Like, mm -hmm. Nick, I've been with you at the Senior Bowl. I've never seen slot receivers just work by themselves in a certain group. So it, it was weird. He has this weird idea of what he wants from slot receivers, I think. So I think that's going to change for him altogether. Interesting. That That's an interesting thought on that. And I also think that goes back to just – General coaching hubris, the idea that, look, we're not going to fit the system around your skill set. We're going to fit your skill set around the system. That almost never works in the NFL or really any foot level football I've seen. I want to ask you a little bit, though, about the offensive line now, because one thing that's been common and clear in the Giants' last two games is their defense has been unbelievable. And the reason their defense has been unbelievable is because they've had some nice matchups. Nobody likes to talk about it, but that Washington interior offensive line was a disaster. Nick Gates had absolutely no chance. God bless him, former Giant, but he had absolutely no chance against Dexter Lawrence. And the Jets had multiple injuries at center, but they had actually no chance against I think Dexter Lawrence has like 33 pressures in his last two games or something like that. I think he had 14 and 19. Is that right, Nick? Did he have 14 against Washington? I don't think he I don't think he had 19, but he's okay. tied for the league lead right now in it's pressures with Nick Bosa. And I'll say this, Marcus, just about Dexter Lawrence. I think he is – and he gets a lot of praise, rightfully so. He might be the most underrated defender in the National Football League. I don't know yeah. how you're, you're – we'll let you answer the question about the offensive line, but, but he wanna... is insane. I want to ask you, yeah, I kind of yeah. want to get a lowdown of not only just like, I just want the whole scope of the O-line because the only okay. thing, I haven't followed it well. All I know is like the Alex Leatherwood disaster. That's all I, that's all I really can remember, right? That, and have they made more investments in that offensive line since? Any major ones or what's really happening on that offensive line? Yeah, yeah. So, I, you know, with the offensive line, I mean, I think they're actually playing pretty well, to okay. be honest. I think they're playing pretty well as a group. I know Van Roden, he, he uh, Run blocking is totally different. So we're talking about pass protection here. Run blocking, they're really struggling. And one of the reasons they're struggling in run blocking because I fit, I feel like they're like zone guys and they're wearing a power scheme. So they're not they, – it's not that they're losing all the time. It's that they're not getting pushed. And when they run like outside zone, inside zone, they look a lot better. They're able to move around. They're, they're, and when they run some tosses, they're able to get outside because there's a lot of athletic guys. Like Parham's athletic. Miller's athletic. Andre James is athletic. I mean, even Mumford has some athleticism for, for his size. Illuminor, uh, I mean, he is a kind of a, you know, that's what he's from Brit, you know, Britain. He kind of came over. He's not really an athletic athlete, really, you would say, but he does his job. He does it pretty well. Uh, it, but I am worried about Dexter Lawrence. I am worried about him because Dexter Lawrence is Andre James's worst nightmare, is a guy that could line up right in front of him. That's Andre James's big problem. If somebody lines up right in front of him, they're gonna beat him down. It's it's, it's not really gonna be fun a day for him. So I'm really worried about that, especially if they notice it on film and they just get a line Dexter right over him. 
it's gonna be a long day for Andre James. It really is. He just, it, I don't know what it is. He doesn't have the play strength for it. His snaps are really slow because he was a tackle from UCLA and they moved him to center. So his snaps are really slow and he's kind of slow to get his hands up after the snap. And a lot of guys kind of do the same move on him. I'm really worried about it. I'm not, I've been, I haven't been able to sleep that much because I've been thinking about all the pressures that Dexter Lawrence might get this week if they put him at those tackle. Because he's going to do this. He, there's a move. There's a move that everybody does on Andre James. And I'm sure as hell he's going to do it. And he's probably do it with a lot more power than most guys do it. And, you know, these are normal guys doing it to him. It's not Dexter Lawrence. So it's going to be interesting to see how that goes. But I think left tackle and right tackle outside, they're solid. I mean, Colt Miller is underrated. He's probably not going to make a Pro Bowl because the Raiders keeps being bad, but he's such a good left tackle. He's solid there. Good run blocker, great pass blocker. Illuminor, like I said, he, he'll hold it down over there. He won't get messed up too much. So, same with Mumford. I mean, the thing is, hopefully we don't get the rotation anymore. He was rotating those guys, Mumford and Luminor. I mean, it's week nine. We're doing like 30 snaps him, 30 snaps oh. the other guy. Yeah, it was weird. So hopefully that changes and they just go with Mumford or Luminor. Just pick a guy and let these guys go for the rest of the year. But uh, either one of those guys is good. Van Roten holds it down. But run blocking, it's, it's just been awful. But we'll see if they do more outside zone and switch it up a little bit. I watched Colton Miller. Well, I watched the Raiders offense uh, before yeah. the news of Jimmy Garoppolo. And I was just like, holy shit. Colt Miller's like kind of handling his own really well against yeah. the talented Lions front. So that's definitely something that stuck out to me as well. And I, I was I was going to go look for uh, Dexter Lawrence clips that I have cut up just to show your audience what he did to the New York Jets. Now, the New York Jets had like three different centers in there, mind you, but he was doing this to Connor McGovern, their number one. One of the things you're going to notice about Dexter Lawrence, Marcus, is how low his hips are at the point of contact. Like I've never seen, like, I don't know if there has been a, a 300, cause this guy is 340 plus, but he's like 342 pounds and he keeps his hips so damn low at the point of contact and he can bend. It's crazy. But now the New York giants, it's a little bit of a new situation cause they did just ship Leonard Williams, who is a good player, a good overall football player was capitalizing on a lot of one-on-one -on -one situations. He is now a Seattle Seahawk. So now the giants are probably going to move. I'm imagining Dan, Raheem Nunez Rochez in next, next to him with Ashawn Robinson being in as base. I'm sure they'll probably rotate and then bring DJ Davidson in there as well. But the defensive line in the trenches has gotten a little bit weaker now without Leonard Williams. That's something that maybe the Raiders can take advantage of. I asked you guys about Patrick Graham. I know you guys are very oh, familiar yeah. with Patrick Graham. Um, so some things I'm very interested in too is if you've seen the Raiders defensive scheme lately, one, and is there a difference between what Patrick Graham was doing in New York and what he's doing in Las Vegas? So, because for me, when I watch the film, I feel like he's a lot more softer in Las Vegas. There's not as much disguise. There's not as much mixing it up. And maybe he doesn't feel like he has the players to do it. So I was kind of wanted to pick your guys' brain a, a little bit on that. Um, if you've seen, watch the Raiders defense a little bit. What do you think is a little bit of the differences that Patrick Graham is doing when he was in New York? When I mean, he has some success there. And then when he's doing over here in Las Vegas. So I haven't seen uh, the Raiders defense. I covered their offense at uh, Big Blue View. And uh, mm -hmm. Marcus, if you want, you can click. Uh, I, I brought up a video. It's just of Dexter Lawrence. It should be in the uh, doc. If you look below, we can add that to the feed. So uh, yeah. I, I have not watched the Raiders, but I'd say that Patrick Graham was pretty soft as the Giants yes. defensive coordinator as well. It was a okay. lot of off zone. It was a lot of we're going to allow you to complete these small little two, three yard gains. We're going to rally and we're going to tackle. That's what Patrick Graham was. He he added against like bad quarterbacks. He would add a lot of cover two invert and cover yep, two okay. uh, like Robert yeah. invert and things like that. The Giants won against Washington off of that with Logan Ryan intercepting. Yep. Uh, I think it was Alex Smith at the time. To be he, had a, he had a good game when it comes to this guy's coverages in that Seahawks game against Russell Wilson. But it was, yeah. it was it was mostly him. drop right. eight. It was Agreed. mostly drop eight. It was eight. a lot of drop eight. And I, I think they realized a lot of the deficiencies with Russell Wilson before right. a lot of other defensive coordinators realized it. We're going to drop eight and we're going to force you to throw over right. the middle of the field because you can't see over your offensive line. <laughs> and I think they just really took took advantage of that. And Leonard Williams also, who now is Seahawk, ironically, ended up had a, great a hell of a game in that one. Okay. But yeah. Yeah. yeah I no, mean, he's going to say, Marcus, he's, he's, he's similar, similar soft defense to what you're seeing. Okay. Yeah, because because that's that's kind of my issue with him a little bit. I mean, like I mean, we did the drop nine against Kyler Murray. I'll never forget that. That was kind <laughs> of 
I don't know why he did that. And it's, it's like uh-huh. something he just does that like it's it's like one game, oh man, that's that's great. And then the next game you're like, what are you doing? And I, and I kinda that dynamic with him is really hurts his defense sometimes. Cause like the Bears game, like I have no idea what they're doing in the Bears game. It's like were they prepared? Do they even take this team seriously? And I don't know if that came from Josh McDaniels, because like reading some of the reports about him about saying what he was about what he was saying some things about Tyson Benjamin, like he was like, whatever, we're I can put Brian Hoyer out there, we're just gonna go kick their butts. <laughs> like so, you know. <laughs> so I don't know if that it has to come into play with Josh and maybe he switches it up a little bit with Antonio Pierce. But yeah, I mean some of that some sometimes that soft defense doesn't work and they're kind of really dependent on Max Crosby getting pressure and you know and then they're right. they, they're not bringing in the great defensive tackles and yeah he's not bringing in the guys maybe he can he wants all the time and they kind of gave him the you know the low budget guys are like hey man we're not gonna spend any money here just make it happen but sometimes it's like you got to do something different than just kind of just let these guys just take what they want you know what i mean so that's kind of my dynamic with him but uh, this is an interesting, interesting perspective i wanted to hear what you guys had to think a little would bit would you familiar with them. What's up? Marcus, would you rather have a defensive coordinator like Wink Martindale, who is who deviates a lot from the uh from a lot of the I guess uh m- methods and, and modes of operation around the league? Would you mm-hmm. want like a coordinator like because we like personally like speaking, like I, I love having Wink Martindale as our defensive <laughs> coordinator. There there are times where it will burn you, but it's just such a fun watch because he does yeah. so many exotic things and he really can take advantage of quarterbacks like say Aiden O'Connell, like he did with Sam Howe, like he did to a certain extent against Zach Wilson as well. Mm-hmm. Against even better quarterbacks like last year, Aaron Rodgers, he was able to defeat him with a really good game plan. Lamar Jackson, they forced two turnovers in the fourth quarter in a game where right. Baltimore was up by I think over 10 points. Uh, in mm-hmm. the second half. So just speaking of like softer defensive coordinators, like Patrick Graham, like we know him, we covered him, Dan. Like personally, I could say I'd much rather have Wink Martindale. Would you agree with that, Dan? And Marcus, what's your, what's your take on that? Completely agree with that. I don't want to ever go back to this. I know it's rare these days. We're seeing so many more defensive coordinators, you know, go into the Fangio principles and go into the two high looks, keep everything underneath. But I appreciate this style of defense. And I also think like a lot of it comes down to like with Mike Barndale, he will mix it up. Like we talk a lot about that Jacksonville game from last year where he dropped eight a lot against Trevor Lawrence. Like that's the thing for me with these coordinators. I just like to see the ones that are have a different game plan week to week. Like what Patrick Graham had, which you're describing, Marcus, like was similar to what we had with the Giants. And if you're if you're running the same stuff every week, it just becomes a little bit more predictable, in my opinion. Miami and yeah. Buffalo. Yeah. Oh, sorry, Marcus. Uh, So I was just going to say, just uh, to Dan's point, Miami and Buffalo, the Giants played them back to back. They weren't too high for like 35 to 40 percent of snaps. They're not a too high. They're a middle of the field close type of, you know, they didn't blitz that much because you're playing Tua who gets football out of his hands like that. Josh Allen, they blitzed a little bit more, but they pick and chose their spot. They use Xavier McKinney as a cornerback on when they anticipated play action bootleg rollouts and Xavier McKinney would jam sink and then flip his hips and turn. And then every time Josh Allen was rolling out in his direction, he basically acted as a spy while also uh, getting his eyes on the backside crossers. And that was one of the more unique things I've seen on tape this season from Wink. Yeah, cool. So, so the reason why I just wanted to bring this up was I don't know if they're going to, they're not going to, I don't know if they'll do anything creative like that against Aiden O'Connell, but he does throw a lot of curveballs, And I don't think he necessarily <laughs> gets the credit for those curveballs because he just has pressure breaks pipes in his yeah. back. Yeah, and to be honest, I would rather watch that too because I was watching the Lions and they blitz Jimmy Garoppolo every oh, play, yeah. and it's all those watching blitzes and seeing how creative you can get. I mean, it's definitely a fun watch. It's funner than to watch the guy just play soft defense all the time. And you know, you, you got to find a balance there, in my opinion. You got to find a way to mix it up and decide when to play soft and when to play aggressive. And you know, I think sometimes Patrick Graham, especially like screens, it, it feel like. You could just tear him up with screens if you just ran screens all day outside wide receiver screens, because if they if the players can't tackle, what what matters there, right? Those guys can't tackle at all. So it, it's a uh, the Raiders can't tackle at all right now. So besides like Max Crosby, he's like the real main guy on defense. Is probably the main person making plays over there. But I, I think Patrick Graham is you know sometimes NFL quarterbacks just aren't that great right now if i'm in my opinion like oh, yeah. overall you Ooh. can find a lot more guys you could do the soft thing and they can't take it they're gonna try to force it downfield they're not gonna take mm-hmm. what, what they get what's in front of them but then you get a josh allen who does it and then they can't stop him and he puts up 38 so yeah that's kind of the dynamic with that good news for the raiders dan when was the last time the giants ran an effective screen 
uh, wide receiver, running back, tight end, they don't have any kind of effect in this at all in the screen game. It's unbelievable, actually, to the extent of how bad they are on screens. But I want to ask you a question, Marcus, about a recent player, the Raiders draft. So I, I was just looking back through, as we were talking, the Raiders draft history, the recent first round picks. It is, I, you know, we always think of it. It's crazy. Like not, there's a lot of teams struggling out there, you know, like we've got Leatherwood, Arnett, Ruggs in the mix here. But one player that I wanted to ask you about is this year's first round pick Tyree Wilson, because he's a player who I'm just going to be honest with you, Marcus. I watched his tape coming out. We tried to do every player for the podcast, even though he probably wasn't in the mix for the giants. We wanted to get some, some look at him. I just didn't, get it from my standpoint. Like I thought he had, there were things I liked about his game. He had heavy hands. I thought he was he had the length that you want for maybe an even front. But when I'm taking somebody at top set uh, 10 overall at 7 overall, I want to see pass rush traits and I just personally never felt like I saw them consistently on his tape. Mm -hmm. Uh has he made any progress with the Raiders and improved in that regard? Have they unlocked them at all? Has working with Max Crosby helped him like where is he at in his development? Yeah, so so with Tyree Wilson, I think what his problem is, he's only doing one move right now. So you're, to answer your question, no, he's not really developing anything. I actually saw more moves at Texas Tech. Like at least, at least at Texas Tech, he had a jab outside and inside yeah. move. Like <laughs> now he's just doing a bull rush, which yeah. I don't know what that that's coming from. It's like a bull rush and then a really weak rip outside. And he doesn't have any bend to really do that. So I think he's trying to figure out how to win, but he is getting better every yeah. single week, which I like from him. I, I, you could tell that he is learning the game, so he's working on it. I think that's something I can notice. Um, he's getting better and he's like getting off the ball quicker. Like I know Baldy really killed him like his first week of the season because he got off the ball really slow. And you saw that on his Texas Tech film as well. Yeah, He just got off the ball just awfully slow. But that is picking up because I think he's figuring out I'm not gonna be a good NFL player if I can't get to the ball quick. Yeah. So those things are on the up and up. I feel like Tyree Wilson is taking the next step every single week because he had his best game against the Bears. I thought he had another solid game against the Lions where he was making a little bit of impact in the run game, which I, would, I expected earlier. You didn't see that early on. He was getting pushed around, but now he's not anymore. So I think he's kind of building there, at least being that guy that can set the edge and you know help out in the run game. Because when he's out there in the run game, they actually are a pretty good run defense right at this point in the last couple of weeks. It's just the pass rushing. It's gonna, it's gonna take some time because he's gotta figure out how to win because he doesn't have the bend, right? right. But since he doesn't have a lot of bend there, um, it, he's gotta figure out how to win in the NFL. And he did bull rush ain't working right now. Guys are just like, okay, you're not that strong, right? This is the NFL. I'm just as strong as you, especially he's on the, since Max is on, you know, the, the left side of the defensive line, he's facing the right tackle, he's facing left tackles. So he's facing the kind of the best tackle on the team right. and that bull rush ain't going to work for him. So he's just got to figure out some more moves, figure out what he needs to do and figure out our pass rush plan, basically. He's the third in the rotation of like pass rushers. Is Malcolm Kuntz above him on the depth chart and gets more snaps than him? Yeah, Malcolm Kuntz is actually getting some pressure. I think he's just a little inconsistent, but he has, like, great bend. I think he's finally getting a chance to get some snaps and so he can grow as a player because, I mean, he was he came from Buffalo and a little bit, you know, working against, you know, weaker competition a little bit. And he really showed a lot of bend there and was able to get a lot of sacks and be productive there. But it was going to take some time in the NFL. He had to get stronger. He wasn't very good against the run. He's a lot better against the run this year too. Is this for some reason, like I said, like Josh McDaniels, and then they play in Isaac Rochelle all the time. I don't know if that's Patrick Graham or if that's Josh McDaniels. We're going to find that out this week with some of these guys because the Bears game really pissed me off because Isaac Rochelle was getting pushed back. Jerry Tilly was getting pushed back. And then Tyree Wilson's having his best game, and you're not playing Tyree Wilson, right? So I don't know how much of that is the previous coach. Is it the new coach going to change all of that? Hopefully he does, and he gets Tyree some more running. We get these young guys out there going. Because I think Malcolm Coots needs some more reps too as well. It's interesting because you guys have Max Crosby, and I imagine that's like so much fun to watch. And I'm just looking at, I'm thinking about your edge rotation. And then I, I go across and I look at the New York Giants, completely different dynamic. I mean, we have Kayvon Thibodeau, who is really starting to come into his own right now. But we were hoping that we would have Aziz Ojolari, who is yeah. a very explosive and very bendy pass rusher from Georgia, who was drafted a couple years ago, but he just can't stay healthy. And Dan, when you look at the Giants' edge, and I know the Giants are able with Wink Martindale to, to bring pressure from a variety of different locations. They'll load up like seven, eight guys on the line of scrimmage. You'll have like two safeties coming and like Dexter Lawrence dropping into coverage sometimes. Not really, but like Wink Martindale does crazy shit. 
But like, who is that second edge, Dan? Would you say that like second? Like, if I have to have him out there, it's him. It's like Jihad Ward. Which Ooh, you guys are very, 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 very specific to Jihad Ward. That's which get makes it so going. much more impressive to me. Yeah, he former rate exactly. Which makes it so much more impressive to me that <laughs> Kayvon Thibodeau has been able to take the jump he's been able to take without any help. I mean, he has had Dexter Lawrence, of course, that helps, but. Um, you know, just on on the on the edge, on an island, on his own. Sometimes taking on double teams, so it's interesting. It's definitely an interesting dynamic. Both teams feel like they're kind of a one major, like you said almost earlier, Marcus. You're like this defense is in, in a lot of ways being held together by Max Crosby. Yeah, I would talk about Kevon Tibble too. What, what yeah. is what is his growth from year one? Is is it like is he developing his pass rush plan too? Because you know, coming out of college, I felt like he depended on the bull rush too, and his bend wasn't something that a lot of people were fans of i would say so but he's learning how to win he's what how many sacks does he have this year eight Almost and a half eight and a half right so he's winning obviously right and he always was a great player like motor wise he always played the run tough nothing that you really yeah. would felt like that you know push you away from him a little bit because when you play the run like how he did in college it, there's always some growth there so what, what what about him the growth that you've seen from year one year two with uh tip it up Right now, it's only been the last couple of weeks. I think we've really been seeing it. But for me, and I'll bring up a, I'll bring up something real quick, and I'll show you what I mean by this. It's his feet and his hands are really starting to work in unison when he has these one-on-one -on -one matchups. I think he's being or uh, doing a better job anticipating what the offensive tackle is doing, and the timing is just really starting to come together for Kayvon Thibodeau. Because, and he brought this up with an interview with Carl Banks, with giant linebacker great Carl Banks, about how this defense. It's an orchestra. Everybody has to work together. So sometimes you're not going to compile stats. I don't know if Wink Martindale has ever had, I don't think Wink Martindale has ever had a, an edge rusher who's had 10 plus sacks. Kayvon Thibodeau has eight and a half at the moment right now. It's not necessarily defense that showcases one edge rusher because they drop Kayvon Thibodeau into coverage a bunch. And sometimes they force slide protection to his side and they bring an overload to the other side. But Kayvon right now is seizing the one-on-one -on -one opportunities in high leverage spots. And we saw it three times against the Jets. He sacked Zach Wilson on the first drive, strip sack, fumble. And then what should have been the last drive, he had two sacks on first and 10 and then on fourth and 10 to ostensibly end the game but then the giants ended up shooting themselves in the foot marcus they had a 99.9 .9 chance to win after that sack a 99.9 .9 chance according to espn analytics and they freaking lost the football game absolutely insane but i'll bring this video up real quick and i'll show you just how he's i would say maximizing his ability to corner and win at the top of the pass rushing arc because that's the thing that um has really impressed me this season and he's doing it with his hands his feet and how he's orienting his hips so we'll look at this right here watch how he brings that inside foot high and to the outside of the frame of makai beckton who's an incredibly long player and he's doing it while he times up this double swipe this punch like that is why because look at the orientation of his hips at the top of the arc they're already pointing directly at zach wilson so he is just Everything is clicking for him at the moment. This is another sack. It's the same. It's a very similar move. It's a double swipe to the rip move. And then he has the closing burst to close with and destroy the enemy with fire maneuver. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that was impressive. See, I didn't see that from him in college, those type of moves. Like that type of move like that, where he's right. you know, chopping and then ripping like that. Because even, you know, there's not amazing bend here, but he wins. So it does it like he could just get around the corner and he has the speed and the power to do it. So, man, yeah, that's some that's some growth right there. And that's when you like somebody like Chandler Jones, which is kind of crazy to bring up Chandler Jones, but he doesn't have bend either, right? Right. And he was a found a way as a technician to win with his hands, and Blank. that's how you end up getting 15 sacks all the time. And you can kind of see that from guys like Kevon Thibodeau when those type of guys who don't have that great bend. That's how you expect them to grow. I think that's a really good call, by the way, Marcus. I kind of, in my head, see a little bit of the similarities in just stylistically those two as yeah. a pass rusher. Yeah, yeah. And and when that's what I'm saying, because when the guys don't have the great band, you want them to turn out like Chandler Jones. Right. Because it's kind of right. like the the model guy of he's not the greatest bendy player, maybe not the most, you know, moving and you know, like he's not Von Miller, basically, right? Right. But if you're a technician and you got the long arms, you know how to mix it up and you know how to use your hands, yeah. You can you can win in the NFL, and that's what it really is all about. You, I, that's, that was great to see from Thibodeau. So, yeah, man, that was great. I mean, you guys maybe want to pull up some Max Crosby here because I got some some Crosby. Yeah, you can pull yeah, up some Max Crosby. Let's, let's run some Crosby.
Yeah. 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 yeah, he yeah wins. Let's, let's scare, let's scare the shit out of our audience. One of my favorite players in the NFL, by the way. That's a non giant to watch. <laughs> week in, week out, whenever he's yeah, at yeah. time. I think he's unbelievable. Yeah. 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 Crosby is a, just a special player just because the motor, man. The motor, he never stops. He plays every snap. He's never, he's not coming on the field. Crosby is not coming off the field. I, I don't know how, the percentage of snaps he plays was like 99% yeah. at this point. And you could just see he's a technician too, but he has the bend. You know, you always see that the, the athleticism out of the combine was off the – his RAS is off the charts, and you see it every single play. And he's just an awesome run defender. You, he reads your keys. You can't block with a tight end. That's just dumb. You're not – it's not going to work. Bro, he's, and, <laughs> he's just – he's just a – He's he's a raider too. That's what I what I love about him, man. He just he's like the one of the, the first guys I've seen in a long time. I'm like, that is a raider. Yeah. Right. I watch his, his him against Patrick Mahomes in the quarterback documentary. Man, that made me hype. I was like, they need to give him a 20 year deal. Yeah. You just see the type of way he plays, man. It's just raider football. Like yeah. I just I haven't seen it in a long time, man. Like since like maybe the nineties of that wow. type of guy that I feel like like it's just that's that's a raider right there. Right, and he sh they shouldn't let him go anywhere just because of that that thought process. But go ahead. He's moving at a at a different speed than everyone else. Like he's like wildly I fast. And an interesting note, they brought this up on Monday Night Football, Marcus. He got all of his tattoos, or at least that big piece that he just got, not far away from my place, man, right here in in the valley. He yeah, got, he got him in Avondale. I was like, wait, really? Like you got him down here to Avondale, like freaking Arizona, such a random ass place. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. That's funny. That's funny. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, well, I guess some big tattoo guy. In, uh, yeah, okay, Avenue, okay. I guess, but nice, I mean, it's nice. like four hour drive, man. To, okay, to Vegas, right? it's super quick, <laughs> super quick. But yeah, Crosby is crazy good, man. I, I, I think he's, you know, I think he's a little underrated too because he, yeah. he doesn't. I, I guess I would say he was he doesn't rack up the sacks like he should sometimes. But I think that is a little bit a mixture of the guys that are around him, and you know, sometimes he 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 can win and. When you're doing Patrick Graham's doing it too, a little bit too, guys get rid of the ball quick. They're letting that ball go really quick, and you're getting those little short passes going. And he's not gonna win, but I think he can finish and get some sacks this week because just because he's relentless, man. I, and he he is pumped. I think I believe a little bit that you know Josh McDaniels is gone, and I think we're gonna see a lot of fire coming out of these guys on defense. And I think he's gonna lead the way because I'm telling you, I, that that's the guy that I hope never leaves the Raiders, man. I I hope he's a Raider for at least a good 13 years. It's gonna be a long time for before he is out of here. So, dude, this could be one of those trap spots for us, Dan. Like it's so interesting this game. Scary. I went into this game thinking, well, the Giants are a two and six team. There's like no traps. There's a trap is not even a word that should Very be used true. for a team this bad. Very but true. I did go into this game, Marcus and Nick, before the news that broke at 1 a.m. for my time, thinking this spread made no sense to me that the Raiders were two and a half point favorites. I loved the Giants this week. Loved them because Giants aren't a good team this year, two and six, but they've lost a lot of games to really good teams. And this is just a team that I don't really like the games I've seen of the Raiders. Like you said earlier, Marcus, don't you didn't know how they were three have won three games this year? I kind of agree. I have no idea. But now things have changed because there is that boost sometimes that happens in the NFL when you fire a coach midweek and you bring in new life. And especially when it's a Joe Judgian type coach where everyone's mm -hmm. walking on eggshells all week. Oh, no, we can't afford to make a mistake. The coach is going to kill us if we run this one route wrong. Like that style that's so stupid and never works. Run, oh, let's run laps. You got to run laps after practice like a high school team. False like, stars, run her lap. Yeah. Like this shit was so obviously not going to work. And yet somehow Giants fans fell for that trap too. Speaking of traps, but. I digress. We're past that point. But, like, then you go from that to a guy like Antonio Pierce. You just know is not that. And you know, like you said, he brings a different level of not just leadership, but former just – Former player, too. Former player, too, who Huge. actually can relate to these people, unlike Josh mm -hmm. McDaniels in a lot of ways. And so now, because of that, I feel very differently about this game. I'm very worried that, <laughs> that that's going to be the boost they need. And now, ultimately, I will be honest, I think Aiden O'Connell is going to have a lot of trouble with Wink Martindale. A lot yeah, of trouble I, with Wink Martindale. So but I don't know necessarily the Giants offense is going to be able to move the ball that well against Patrick Graham, who's knows Daniel Jones very well. 
He knows what yeah. Daniel Jones does well. He knows the concepts he work that works for him. He knows the concepts that don't work for him. And he knows the trap type coverages that can beat Daniel Jones. So I just think it's going to be a very interesting game from that standpoint. You guys getting that boost of firing midweek. If you don't fire McDaniels, by the way, midweek, I would have thought the Giants. I would put a lot more. I would I already bet on the Giants this week, which I never do, by the way, which I never do. It's the first game this year I bet on the Giants. But I did it before the news. So, you know, if I if I had Maybe it would have changed if not, but we'll see what's going to happen. I think that makes it an interesting setup. Yeah, because to be honest, I would I, I was with you. I was really scared if they would win another game. To be honest, with Joshua Daniels, just because the NFL has figured him out, man. They're, they're just yeah. playing the dig routes on third down. <laughs> they're going to run digs, so some kind of dig is either going to be dagger or it's going to be like a double digs or it's going to be levels. It's it's one of those three yeah. on third down, and the whole NFL was 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 ready for it. So it wasn't going to work for him, especially with Jimmy Garoppolo quarterback. He wasn't going to he wasn't going to go with anybody else. He was really trashing it, you know, kind of a little bit after his start, yeah. which I thought was super weird. So uh, what was that? I missed that. Uh, like he basically just kind of killed him. Like he said, "This is the NFL, and in our league, you can't turn the ball over." It's like what oh, in wow. our league? <laughs> what a loser! Our league. Oh, what a pop is douche, man. Oh, it's so yeah. crazy. Oh. <laughs> he was the worst, man. He really was. So yeah, and then he just killed his rookie quarterback like that. And you know, that's why I think I think Aiden O'Connell's gonna struggle a little bit this week. I hope Raiders fans are are ready for that because these blitzes are going to be crazy, yeah. and they're, he's going to throw at them. And I don't know if they're going to mix up this short passing game enough and give him enough hot reads and those things that he can get rid of the football where he knows to go with it. So hopefully they have him prepared for it. And I know he'll be able to handle it overall, but from a quarterback aspect, I'm not talking about toughness here. We got to throw the ball. We got to read it and do all those things. It's going to be right. tough for him there, right? I know he'll be able to handle it mindset wise, but playing quarterbacks could be a little different. But you know, I think Adams and those guys are gonna they're gonna try to make plays for him. I think I think they believe in him. They're gonna try to go out there and mix it up. And hopefully Patrick Graham has a good defensive plan for this game. Uh you know, the, like Giants offense isn't that scary and they've done pretty good against below average offenses. So we'll see how that goes with them. But I'm really worried about Dexter Lawrence. I'm not gonna if anything else, I'm not worried about Wink Martindale. If anything, I'm worried about Dexter Lawrence. I've been he's I watched that Vikings game for last year. Like, <laughs> I, I can't get over that game. I can't even. So, now Dexter Lawrence concerned. is yeah. Dexter Lawrence is the player. If I had to circle one player of the Giants, if Raiders fans should be scared of it's definitely certainly Dexter Lawrence. I would say the run defense overall, because I know the Raiders have struggled to run the football this mm -hmm. season. The run defense overall has really solidified over the last, I would say, since the Miami oh, game yeah. where they got shredded by horizontal runs. Their, uh, their linebacker duo of Micah McFadden, who's a fifth-round second-year player out of Indiana, and Bobby Okereke, an uh, individual that the Giants signed to a 10-year con or a $10 million contract this offseason, he's yeah. really starting to, to earn that money. So the run oh, yeah. defense is something that like, I'm imagining you guys are going to want to run the football with a rookie quarterback. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's going to be a lot of one-on-one -on -one situations. Well, I don't know if Wink Martindale is going to want that, so it's interesting because normally there would be a lot of one-on-one -on -one situations. Against Aiden O'Connell, I'm not certain with Devontae Adams, Jacoby Myers. So that's like something as a Giants fan, as somebody who covers the Giants, I'm really interested in how do they handle Devontae Adams with Deontay Banks because we've seen Wink Martindale use shadow coverage, cloud coverage over Tyreek Hill, over Stefan Diggs, but there were certainly times where it was like, hey, Trey Hawkins, you can cover Tyreek Hill one on one, and it led to a 60 yard touchdown. So I really hope Tay Banks, if he gets that opportunity against Devontae Adams, he holds his own because last week was probably his worst week as a professional. We're still very yeah. high on Deontay Banks. I think he's um, going to be a good cornerback in this league, but holy crap, Devontae Adams is a. Uh, just a, just a really good wide receiver still. And I wonder yeah, if there's he, a squeaky wheel narrative too there with Deontay, yeah, with Deontay, with Deontay Adams. Like, you know, after last week, and I know that people said that would be the case two weeks ago, I know as well, but just feels like there might be some extra incentive to get him the football this week. Oh, yeah, and he demands the football too. I mean, he's a little bit of a diva. Is that a little bit underrated with him? Yeah. He demands <laughs> the football he demands it because he got yeah, it so much it. with rogers rogers was such a one read like you know, we, like rogers locked into him they had such a good rapport it's just so interesting from his perspective how things have gone marcus like yeah he accepts this like i'm sure they talked about it his agent and he's like you're gonna get a big deal out of this that's the cool part i know you want a lot of money the backers were being cheap about this like idiots but you're gonna lose Rodgers. Here's what we can give you: we can give you a guy you played college football with. We can give you a guy you have a report built in. And then one year after that, they get rid of that guy. 
And so mm-hmm. now you get Jimmy Garoppolo, who, you know, I've talked about this a lot with Nick, but I've always felt he's one, he's the single most overrated quarterback in the entire NFL. Anytime I watched him on tape, I thought he was horrible. I thought he was mm-hmm. a pure product of Kyle Shanahan, who was basically mm-hmm. just hitting his back foot and throwing the football. Like you said earlier, Kyle's almost like pointing where to go with the football. <laughs> and his ball placement is just god awful for someone who's a starting quarterback on the vertical plane and on the intermediate to vertical plane. It just, it just sucks for, I just hate to see a player like Devonte Adams have to like finish his career. Like not, not with the Raiders. I'm not yeah. trying to take a shot at you and your fans, by the oh, way, I'm I'm right there, just with Jimmy Garoppolo. So like it could also work out, by the way, he could get Caleb Williams for next year for the rest of his career. That would be yeah. cool. Right. Or something like that. But mm-hmm. it just sucked for me to, to see him get waste away a little bit. It felt like with Jimmy G. Yeah, because even with, even with Carr, they, he yeah. still had 14 touchdowns and 1,500 yards, right? Right. Uh, and even with Jared Stidham, I mean, Jared Stidham still got right. some, big, some big yards, and they low-balled Jared Stidham this year, and I feel like he would have played a lot better than all the For quarterbacks sure. are actually Who here. Jimmy yes. <laughs> right? Yeah. So, yeah, they, these, it, I'm just happy McDaniels is gone, to be honest. I, that, yeah. that regime, just their, their vision. I don't know what the hell they were doing. I don't even know if they had a plan. Like they signed a bunch of guys and then they got rid of all the guys. I mean, oh. you know, Darren Waller, he's injured. We didn't get a chance to even talk about him, but yeah. he, like, like they moved him and they kind of put him in the doghouse a little bit early on. And they were playing like the Steelers game. They're playing Foster Moreau, all these Ugh. snaps and they weren't playing Darren Waller. So like he had to go, man. I, I don't know what the hell his problem is. And hopefully he never, Send him back to New England, but he's going Bill back to New fired. England. I feel like Bill's sure. Bill, 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 picking him right back up. <laughs> when Bill gets fired, though, where does he go? He ain't going nowhere else. Yeah, uh, yeah. Say that. Yeah, that's his last stop. Yeah, man. All right, guys. Uh, anything else we want to talk about? Anything else? Uh, we like to end on score prediction. If you want to run, yeah. that okay. Down. All right, all right, all right. Score prediction. Yeah. All right. So, so if I want to go this, it, it, I think it's gonna be really low scoring. I'm gonna go there. It's gonna be really low scoring. I'm gonna go. I'm going to go 13 to 10 Raiders. I'm going that low. So yeah. that low scoring. Okay. <laughs> That's, right. That's where I'm going. That's where I'm going right. with it. I, I'm, I'm not too far behind you. I'm okay. going to I'm gonna go, let's say, I don't think the Giants can score that much, man. I, I just don't. I'm going to go 16, 13 Giants. Okay. I think it's like nice. the same exact score I went with last week with the Giants. Giants. Jets. But you yeah. had Jets winning that one, I believe. No, um, yes, yes, I did. I picked yeah, Giants early in the Jets. week, and then I went. Yeah. Then I did go back to the Jets. But yeah. I'll say this, Marcus: I think the Giants are at least going to have a healthy kicker for this game, so that should help. <laughs> <out>. <laughs> okay, all right. All yeah, right. They, they, just put a, they just put their kicker, who they extended before the year, to clear cap space because they were in such a bad cap situation. They had to extend him, and then he, they played him last week before going on IR this week where he needs knee surgery. So they played him through. Apparently, he needs knee surgery. So that was a disaster. They lost the game on a missed field goal, essentially. So just a weird decision by the Giants that obviously needs to be visited by somebody. Um, I think Justin Penick, shout out to him. He had a nice rant on it tonight about how they've handled injuries, but it's been really poor on the Giants front. But as far as my prediction goes, Marcus, you'll find this funny, but because you just had a low score prediction, so did Nick. Yeah. But last week I predicted a 12-6 game Giants Jets, and I wasn't that far off. It was 13-10. <laughs> the only touchdowns in that game were one a fluky ass play to to Brees Hall that like required four missed tackles by the Giants and was not a good throw or anything like that. And then the only other touchdown game was like a drive extended by three dumbass Jets penalties and a zone read keeper for the for Danny or for Tommy DeVito. Danny or, DeVito. Or, or Tommy DeVito. <laughs> <laughs> so like the, I was very close to getting that score right. I actually think we're gonna finally see some touchdowns in this game. And I think the Giants are actually going to score a pair of touchdowns in this game. Oh wow. Oh, okay. Yes. And I think one of them is going to come on defense. So, oh, okay. Yeah. So I think the Giants are actually going to put up. I'm going with 20 points, which for the Giants <laughs> right now feels like an absolute miracle, to be honest with you. I'm going with 20 Giants, and then I'm going to go with 20 to 13, 13 points for the Raiders. The same score prediction of what you put, but just Giants putting up 20 somehow. And so I'm going to go with the Giants win still, even though I am a little worried about the Antonio Pierce boost. I mean, yeah, I mean, the Raiders haven't scored more than 20 points either. So that's why I was like, this is going to be a low-scoring okay. game. Um, I don't know. And, and Wink, the Wink Martindale versus Aiden O'Connell, yeah, I was a little bit nervous about that anyways. And then he gets the Jets next week. He, he's he's going to – he's fighting. He's facing the fire. It's gonna yeah, be, he is. It's going to be a lot is. of growth for him. A lot of growth for yep. him. So I appreciate you guys, us coming together and doing this. This was fun. That was fun. Um, you know, the fun stuff, man. I really appreciate you talking to you guys, talking football. 
and it was good stuff. So draft, you know, you know, maybe we'll meet up on the draft. You know, yeah. I hear you hearing you break down Tyree Wilson, man. I made you excited for some of your draft stuff. So I liked it. Uh, yeah, we do draft over here, man. I, I love to do a draft. Of course, uh, Matt Holder, he does, that's his thing. He does have a bleacher report. So, um, awesome. we'll check out you guys, you know, give your, uh, Twitters one more time and shut out your podcast. Yeah. So mine is Dan Schneier <laughs> NFL. You can find our podcast, big blue banter on YouTube, type in big blue banter or on iTunes or Spotify. And you can find Nick at Nick Filato. You can also find his work his written work at big blue view and sports illustrated sometimes. Yeah, perfect. And of course, I'm Marcus Johnson at the March on NFL, SB Nation, silverandblackpride.com. I'm over there. And of course, you know, Tape Don't Lie. This is what we do over here. We watch the Tape Raiders film. Uh, has it hasn't been that exciting. Hopefully it gets a little bit better. Um, but same, you know, bro, same. <laughs> <laughs> same. All right, guys. Uh hit the subscribe button. Like always, subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. And right here, peace. <laughs>